All right. Looks like we're live. Time to stop checking ourselves on the camera. <laughs> hey, I have with me Mr. Stalin, and we are going to talk a little bit about staying resilient in challenging times. Steve, what's Woo! happening, buddy? <laughs> It's it's always it, it, you know the thing is it's always challenging times right wherever you right. are wherever you are there's a challenge somewhere we happen to be having a nice common challenge right now but in some ways mm -hmm. I think that actually has a positive impact in the sense that it brings us together as a community and you know forces us to be a little bit more kind uh, a little bit more generous and a little bit more wise yeah it doesn't force us to do that because there are people who aren't doing any of those things. So I'm seeing a little bit of both. And by the way, I'm looking down just to distribute the content across the different places that I put it. Yep. So I, I bear with me just one second as I do this. Okay, I think we're good. Um, I'm seeing <clears throat> probably a fairly predictable distribution along the bell curve that this coronavirus situation is bringing out in us. I'm seeing... Again, predictably, the edges of the bell curve are the loudest. I find that to be a, a fascinating sort of uh, um, uh, how consistent that is through mm -hmm. through all things, right? When you take people and you put them all in a salt shaker and you shake them all out, they always distribute across a bell curve, but somehow the edges are always the loudest. Um, and so here's a question for you. Why do you think that is? <laughs> Why do you think the the sort of most extreme views on any given thing, certainly that we have this global situation that we can all relate to, um, tend to be the most you know outspoken and loud and, and grab the most sort of headspace and airtime and all of that stuff? Ratings, baby, ratings. You know, the, first and foremost, we have to realize the the psychology of the human being is is that we are um, we're always striving to create sameness and and a certain kind of uh, you know predictable system, right? And so, as a result, we're constantly looking for something that's not the same, something that's an outlier. Mm -hmm. So those are the things we always see. You know, you could walk into a room and see a tree of white, but then there's one thing that's red. That's the first thing you're going to see. So we're, it's just kind of the way we're wired. Um, and then what we do is we spend the rest of our time trying to pull everything back toward the middle. We are meaning-making machines. Regression to the mean. Regression to the mean. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah no, it's true. We are a meaning-making machine. Um, we're pattern right? we're, we're pattern seekers, right? Right. This, this, is, this is sort of the the – maybe one of the most fundamental heuristics that that is sort of hardwired into us so that we don't have to stop all the time and analyze every single thing discreetly. Um, but there are challenges that seem to come with that too. Um, as I'm sure you'd agree. One of the things that I find fascinating, I sort of think of it as one of the uh, great cosmic jokes about the human experience is that we are now in an interesting place in our evolutionary arc where we have, and th sure, the coronavirus shows uh, uh, what you might think of as a vulnerable backdoor into the system we've built. But by and large, with the advent of cities and transportation and medicine and all these things, we've built a very, very insulated, safe life for ourselves. However, we still have evolutionary drives in us that are ticking off and reacting as though we're still in the hall grass and saber tooth tigers are a legitimate risk. You know, I mean? it's, it's really, um, so I guess what I'm wanting to bring up here is, is, do you find it interesting or funny, or do you have two cents to share on how do we, how do we know in ourselves that we have these sort of what uh, my one of my martial arts instructors back in the day called leftover evolutionary drives, hmm. you know, drives that are that that really helped us. For instance, again in the time of the saber tooth tiger, you know, the 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 super quick cut heuristics. Right, me and you were walking, 
we see a saber tooth tiger, it bites my arm off, but you get away. Chances are no one in our tribe is ever going to have to tangle with a saber tooth tiger again because of the impact of that experience. It's going to impact you, Mikey, your, your, uh, your nervous system. You're going to go back to the tribe. You're going to share the story. The story is going to be so potent it impacts everybody else. And from there on out, we all avoid saber tooth tigers. Point I'm making is there are, there are <laughs> I'm extemporizing now because I'm saying, I'm thinking, well, you could call this coronavirus a saber tooth tiger. But what I'm talking about more is the way that we're all falling back on heuristics without doing much, if any, real sort of critical thinking to arrive at our own vision. And this is something I know that you know about. So I guess I'm curious, Steve, how, how can we each make a choice to sort of engage in more critical thinking, especially during a time like this where it, it's really important? Great question. Well, first of all, you know, one of the things that that having some kind of an impending, uh, impending fearful situation arise offers us is the possibility yeah. uh, to be more profoundly alive. Right. That, you know, that moment when we're running from the saber toothed tiger, we're we've never been more alive than that. Right. right. The moment when, right. Our, yeah. when our survival is threatened, we've never been more alive than that. And so there are different there's a spectrum of how we respond to things that take us out of the norm, out of the comfortable, out of the um, what you described early on as being kind of the the automatic habituated patterns that we've arrived at that get us through the day to day, day our day to day lives. But what's necessary is sort of a, uh, a, a, a super awareness or a meta awareness over the whole okay. system that allows us to know when we're in a situation that's designed for us to be essentially on automatic, right? Mm -hmm. I'm home. There are things I do every day the same way. I don't have to think about them because they, you know, they're my automatic, they're my patterns, but not to rely so heavily upon patterns that I'm unable to step out of them or that I'm gonna resist the fact that now I'm in a new thing. In other words, what's our capacity to experience change? Right, what's our capacity to yeah, change? Yeah, yeah. Because that's what this really is about. It's about, I've developed a way of running my life in a very methodical, un, you know, kind of um, unexamined way because I don't have to examine it anymore. I know that the floor yeah. is hard. I know right. that the, you know, that right. water is wet. I know all that stuff. And so I could just, you know, grab water from the tap and drink it without thinking about it. Right. But I can't right. respond to the saber tooth tiger that way. I can't respond to the coronavirus right. that way. And I also right. can't respond to my own emotions that way, unless I develop what I'm calling that kind of umbrella awareness or that meta awareness where I could yeah. say, okay, my automatic tendency is to jump to conclusions, to create a pattern, to resist, to shut down, to fight or flight. Mm -hmm. But what if I paused? What if I became quiet? What if I were able to um, observe the experience I'm having right now from a more backstage perspective? And what would that do? What yeah. would my life look like if something happens and rather than immediately reacting to it, I were able to kind of breathe into it, maybe even lean into it? What would I what would I get from it? What would I learn from it? What would I, you know, how would that, you know, the the demand for change change me for the better? And so I think that it's possible that somebody listening to this would say to themselves, but that sounds like a bunch of new age, touchy feely, you know, how's that going to help me with this? Well, help you with what? What's the thing you need help with? This, uh, let's use the coronavirus since it's so front and center and we can all relate to it in some form or another, right? To, to buy one narrative is to accept the idea that you are at high and imminent risk of death. Mm-hmm. To accept another narrative uh, is to accept the idea that you are being manipulated by nothing short of a sinister global cabal. 
to accept a third narrative. This uh, of I, I see three basically. Now there may be more. Um, what I generally perceive as three. Mm -hmm. uh, to accept a third narrative is to say there's a massive staggering overreaction, and and it's a serious issue, but. Um, but the way it's been dealt with, you know, the cure is worse than the disease, so to speak. Uh, I want my freedoms. I want my liberties. I want my rights. And, and, you know, like, and I felt myself digging my heels in on this too. <clears throat> it's like, it's like, fuck you. Don't tell me what to do. Well, but all of those, well, there's, yeah, that's all, you know, my, in my way of thinking from the perspective, mm -hmm. I look at this from, first of all, the cure is not worse than the disease. The disease is death, right? Like as, my, as uh, the mayor of New York uh, said, he said, it's death. Yeah. You know, you may be yeah. having all kinds of uh, challenges to your freedom, but they're not worse than death. Right. Yeah. So, so, so if you accept the narrative that you're not being lied to, that there is in fact a fatal illness of foot, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, then you've got to do what's appropriate to prevent yourself from falling prey to that. That's just mm -hmm. like common sense. The thing that really th th that puzzles me is the the fact that most people aren't looking at the addiction. The they're, addiction. They're not, they're not. They're not rising to the opportunity that's being presented to them. So the opportunity that's being presented to you is this: It's like you've been living your life this way, doing mm -hmm. X, Y, and Z. Yeah. And now all of a sudden you can't do it the way you always did it. Mm -hmm. You have a choice right now. You could either push back against that, right? Which means, you know, either throwing up conspiracy theories or just pouting or being angry or, you know, pointing fingers or sneaking around trying to do what you want to do, despite what all the scientists are telling you to do, or you could just accept the situation as it is. Mm -hmm. Those are your choices. You either don't accept it or accept it. Right. Right. The situation is not going to change regardless if you accept it or you don't accept it. So if the situation is not going to change and you are missing the opportunity to practice the art of acceptance. Okay. This is one of the, this is one of the greatest less. I mean, this is a spiritual lesson. This is what Jesus tried to teach. This is what the Buddha tried to teach. Mm -hmm. right? It's like be here now, accept what's going on right now and maximize your experience within that. Learn to experience joy right now. Learn to be peaceful right now. Learn to be compassionate toward others right now. And now you, these freedoms are being taken from you. Some people will say they're being taken from you by the government. Other people, I think those who I think are a little bit more realistic, will say they're being taken from me by this virus. But how do you how do you yell at a virus? You can't yell at a virus. So instead, I'll yell at you know um, the governor or something, right, or or whatever mm -hmm. it is. So. These freedoms are being taken from me regardless of what the cause. Now, what am I going to do with that? What am I going to do in this moment with the recognition that I can't do things the way I've always done them? What do you do? You know, I mean, to me, this is where, you know, my book Bulletproof comes in. It's like this is what resilience is. It's adapting to change. Right. It's, it's accepting the situation and thriving in the situation. Nobody thrives in a situation while complaining about it. Nobody thrives in a situation while feeling uh, victimized by it. They only thrive in a situation by accepting this is the situation. What's the, mac what's the way that I can maximize my experience right now? And to me, that means not only, you know, how am I going to change my view of how to do my work? Not only how am I going to change the way I communicate with people because now I've got to use uh, the computer where you used to be able to do it belly to belly. But also, how am I going to change my relationship with the addiction I have to the to my own thinking, we're all addicted to so it. We're all junkies. Every one of us is a junkie, right? And that's what I wanted to. Um, I mean, you really laid out a lot of things I'd like to talk about. But um, initially, you said you know we're we're uh, stuck in the addiction, um, and so so your your point then is that. The coronavirus situation is revealing, among other things, revealing that we are stuck in addictive patterns of thinking. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Um, let me tease it out for just a moment longer and then let you get yeah, back. Please, okay. please do. Um, in this country, when, when somebody does something uh, that is against 
the law that is against the you know the laws of society or whatever we put them in jail we stick them in a little cell right sure to be punished right in india or tibet you go into a little cell to become enlightened same cell right right so you're yeah. either in the cell to be punished and your mind frame is i this is not fair and i shouldn't be here and you know and i'm being punished and i don't like it and over here it's like thank the Lord, thank God that I have the opportunity to be in this little cell where I'll be able to experience whatever I need to experience to come through it. So it's all mm -hmm. how you look at the situation you're in. Sure. So what would you say then, since this is where the conversation is taking us, yeah. what would you say <clears throat> to the, the, the assertion that you might be just providing a blueprint for how to accept something that someone finds untenable? Mm -hmm. How would you respond to that? So I'm creating. So, the, so are are you are you stating it in the form of accusation or in the form of just like just just what is? Well, I want to keep it sort of in the realm of of uh, you know supple dynamic conversation back and forth. So I feel like that may come out as an accusation for someone who hears this, right? That's some something someone would jump to. For me, I'm not stating it as an accusation. I'm, I'm saying, Steve, what do you say to the person who comes to you and says, this just sounds like you're telling me how to accept my fate, you know, when I don't like the fate at all, right? I would say, um, you know, go back and reread the serenity prayer. That says, mm -hmm. accept the things I cannot change, change the things I can, and have the wisdom to know the difference. Is this something right. you can change? If it's not something you can change, then yes, that's exactly what I'm telling you. I'm telling you to take the things you can change and right. learn how to accept them. But not just accept them. As, you see, there's a difference between tolerating something and accepting something. Right. Like the way I look at it yeah. is that the time I spend observing my own tendency to be reactive to things the time mm -hmm. I spend going to that umbrella meta place I was talking about and noticing yeah. my tendency to be angry or accusatory mm -hmm. or feel like a victim or yeah. be depressed. Yeah. And yeah. that I at the same time got a, a meta awareness that's like the loving witness to all that. That, mm -hmm. that that's actually growing me as a person. That's making me right. uh, uh, stronger, more resourceful. It's giving me a better sense of humor, by the way, because people who mm -hmm. are pushing against reality without any ability to just look at it can't make a joke about it yeah all right so so i view it as yeah i'm going to be uncomfortable but i'm going to be okay <clears throat> learn how to be comfortable about being uncomfortable because it's yeah and impact and i think you're 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 sort of talking about what i would almost call like uh spiritual life skills 101 right yeah, yeah. you know this is foundational stuff this is the stuff with which we are able to move into and through uncomfortable changes and without which we're, we effectively sort of dash ourselves against the rocks. Yeah. And it, you know, it's funny cause you called it foundational and I think it is foundational, but I think a lot of people skip the foundation and they build. Capital. Well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> just because it's foundational doesn't mean everyone has it. Yeah. What yeah. I mean by that, I thank you for, for saying that to be clear foundational means in this context, uh, if we're were to be arranged on a uh, a Maslowian a Maslowian hierarchy, it would be at the bottom. Yeah. Right. It, it's something without which you don't really stand a lot of chance of moving into more more sort of sophisticated realms of self awareness. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah. the the process by which we gain self awareness, you know, almost requires that we are willing to be with the present moment be with what is right and experience right. all the ways in which we resist it but to experience mm -hmm. all those ways that we resist it from a place of wisdom right yeah. like like a parent watching a kid get angry that they're not allowed to have a lollipop mm -hmm. you know if your kid is feeling it's not fair i should have a lollipop you don't then you know sit down and like explain the physiology of why lollipops aren't a good idea you know you just you do whatever the right parenting thing is to do in that situation. Right. Which but I personally have no idea. <laughs> Luckily, you don't have to think about that. Yeah. 
So earlier you uh, you referenced the Serenity Prayer, which is uh, I really love the Serenity Prayer because on the surface it's it's very simple. Yeah. But there's a lot of ability to reflect deeply into it, and for what comes up here for me is the uh, the Serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. How do we know? what parts of this and so coronavirus seems to be our sort of our our touchstone for this conversation right it just has sort of presented we didn't plan this guys in case you're wondering steve and i didn't powwow beforehand it's just all coming out organically but so it seems to be the coronavirus in order to have this conversation nor (laughs) nor did we cause the that's right that's right as far as you know i have no 5g wuhan bats just off camera but so here's the thing um I have, uh, I'm, I'm working on my, I think my 24th year of sobriety. I have enough of the years lined up without getting high that I don't count them all that seriously anymore. I don't count them all that closely. So it's either the 23rd or the 24th. Yeah. But I say that to say this, I have taken a lot of sort of uh, spiritual long walks in the rain, you know, to get to the bottom for me of, Where's the line between the serenity and the courage? You know what I'm saying? Well, it was a good metaphor with taking long walks in the rain. You know, in that situation, uh, you it's raining. Right. Period. Right? Yeah. And then can you be serene about walking in the rain? Because there are a lot mm-hmm. of people who don't ever ask themselves that question. It's like right. it's raining. That means this sucks. That yeah, means totally. A bad day. That means that I'm going to get all wet and I'm going to get sick. In other words, we, you know, they catastrophize, they judge the experience yeah. rather than just, you know, what if I'm walking in the rain and I'm just walking in the rain? Maybe I even yeah. like walking in the rain. Yeah. Right? So the courage is, you know, the, the courage doesn't come into play there. Serenity comes into play there. I agree. Um, to to continue the analogy, though, the the courage to change the things I can might be the courage to grab a raincoat umbrella, or the courage right. to get an umbrella. Right. right. Um, and I think that to to best serve this question, we'll have to sort of push through the constraints of the analogy and and just get into the abstract where it, it's an important question, like how do we know when to go, okay, I'm just I got this is this is what is and and it's it's bigger than me or different from me or it's in you know in in Stephen Covey speak, it's outside of my sphere of influence. So I'm going to work on acceptance. And how do we know when it, there's still something worth the effort that's in our sphere of acceptance? For me, it's always been a blurry line. It is a blurry line. And it dep- and in certain situations make it a blurrier line, like in relationships, right? Uh-huh. When is it time to uh, pull the plug and, and get that divorce? Yeah. And when is yeah. it time to uh, stay and fight for a better relationship yeah. or... Um, or use the relationship as a vehicle for consciousness because I could maybe work on my patients in situations that try my patients. Yeah. Right? yeah. So yeah, it's always a blurry line. But yeah. the thing that I think most people don't really uh, accept is that whenever there's a situation that arises that has a large degree of, of out of controlness to it, like I can't mm-hmm. control the situation. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, maybe I could spend some of my time trying to figure out how I could get some control over this. Maybe, you know, I could organize a protest or something. Mm-hmm. Like that. Maybe there's something in it. But what most people don't do is they don't default to that, um, to embracing every quote unquote unwanted situation, every painful situation as an opportunity to grow themselves. Right. That's the thing we're not doing. So in other words, I feel like we're all missing an opportunity. Yeah. And and I'm tracking that. I I get that that's how you feel. And I really want to, um, I want to unpack that Yeah, because speaking for myself, Mm -hmm. and I don't know if this, if this sort of extrapolates into the population or not, in some ways I'm very much a sort of a population representative. Mm -hmm. And in other ways I'm a total outlier. Mm -hmm. And, And so I don't know which is which here, but what I can say to you is this, in the beginning for me, the first, let's call it the first 10 years of the 23 years, I've really been asking myself hard questions so that I wouldn't go and do meth again. Right. You know, 
uh, and crash cars and go to jail and shit like that. Um, the first long, long stretch, the pendulum went way the hell over into acceptance. And what happened was <laughs> I was accepting being walked on. I was accepting being, you know, uh, manipulated and all these things. And, and then the pendulum swung way over to like this sort of courage and wisdom place, but not, <laughs> in, not in a true way, right. you know, in a way where I was like, it was important, but what I was basically doing was overreaching as I stepped into my power. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, 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 and I think that's the evolution of the process. I mean, first of all, it's an art, not a science. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and, mm -hmm. and part of the, part of the art is you're gradually trying to approximate wisdom. And so you're going to be playing at both ends of that spectrum, and and you're often going to be a little too far on one side or the other of that. You yeah. see that with people. You back in the day, there used to be that um, you know, assertiveness training, you know. So you oh have, yeah, est. Uh, yeah, well, and then you know, you, like if people for years who had been getting stepped on, people had working all over them, and then suddenly right. they, they were like, you know, you can't talk to me like that. But yeah. I just went for a glass of water, you know. Yeah, but, <clears throat> but they're like planting their flag whenever they could, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. that was that was an evolutionary process. I mean, most of those yeah. people eventually evolved beyond that as well. So yeah. yeah, there's no question that you can be just the doormat and just you know, like you could think of acceptance as being you know passive in situations where you shouldn't be passive, or just like you know, being a, a doormat. And that's certainly not what I'm talking about. And then yeah. the other side of the spectrum, you know, being somebody who's assertive or self-aware, uh, you know, you could look at it as, uh, well, I'm going to not let anybody get away with anything. And yeah, we've seen both sides that again, the outliers on yeah. that bell curve. But I think ultimately what we're trying to do is uh, is to um, cultivate the that level of self-awareness that allows us to know when we're too far on one side or on the other side. Right. Yeah, I, I think that um, I really like how you said we're trying to approximate wisdom. And uh, I, I had a very visceral image when you talked about the assertiveness training stuff, because I remember when that was sort of rolling through society yeah, yeah. shortly after Est was established. Yeah. And I heard somebody, I heard a joke somewhere that said, oh, you went to an Est training? What was it like? Oh, I paid $4,000 to learn how to stand up and shout in the middle of a circle of people. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. Well, but, um, uh, let's, let's bring it back to the sort of, um, standardized reactions to coronavirus. Okay. Um, I'm, I gather that your position is to, is one more of this is happening. Let's, let's look at how we can accept it and thrive, mm -hmm. uh, and not one of, feeling retaliatory against the the what I'm going to call the overreach and the and the you know I mean governments by nature are not quick reacting instruments mm -hmm. right they they don't react quickly they're mm -hmm. if anything good at longer term sort of things mm -hmm. and so crisis response has never been something in my lifetime that I've seen other than wars uh -huh. where I've seen governments really be johnnies on the spot and so to me, what I see here is I see a, a virus mm -hmm. that kills people. Mm -hmm. I also see um, a, a little bit of ambiguity around whether it would truly have been some horrifically worse than a really bad other set of things that kill people, you know. Um, and so to me, it looks like, I don't want to say this the way I would say it if I was being cheeky, Uh but it looks like there's a certain amount of cherry picking which kind of death we protect against. You know, when I look at mortality rates from obesity, from drunk driving, from these these standard things, and, and some will say, but they're not uh, contagious. I, I guess I want to know, um, why do we want to sort of make our peace with one and fight against the other? Those those that are fighting, those that are pushing, what is it that's triggering the 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 desire to fight here but not there? To fight, as in to try to fight the disease or to fight the uh, to fight the restrictions, to fight the the the, oh. the 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 trend towards staying home. I mean, 
there's a, there's a lot to unpack here, right? This is not a this is not a lightweight issue, not even a lightweight question. But well, I think we got to be really careful about not you know not approaching anything like in a juvenile way. Yeah, like, you know, it's like uh, it's juvenile when you know when uh, somebody accuses you know somebody says who spilled the milk and uh, and and little Johnny says Mary spilled the milk and right. then Mary who actually did spill the milk says. Yeah, well, you jumped on your bed. It's right. Like one thing has nothing to do with the other. You're basically deferring from the from the situation as it is. And in the same way, I I don't disagree with you at all. I think we should be doing a better job with uh, with chronic illness, mm -hmm. you know, with, uh, with obesity, with diabetes, with uh, dietary choices, um, with mindset, which to me is the most important one because it determines. Yeah, of course. Is. Like we should be, we should be doing all that, and, and there are people who are doing all that, mm -hmm. and we've got this new thing. Yeah. So when I hear people talk about, well, more people have died of, well, first of all, that's no longer true anymore because now more people are dying from this, and it's an accelerating number, um, which we've been seeing from the beginning. It's on its way up, and it's at first it was exponential, right? So to say that uh, you know more people die from some other thing doesn't matter because this is an additional thing. Right. Happening fast, and we have to react to it as fast as we possibly can because it's happening fast. Right. Yeah. So um, I don't think that any of those arguments would would be made if it weren't for the fact that people are resist are are uncomfortable with the sacrifices they're being asked to make. I agree with that one hundred percent. So so there's there's an ulterior motive. It's like if like if let's say that you are being asked to do all the things you're being asked to do right now. Mm -hmm. And somebody was giving you your full salary. Right. Okay. So there was no monetary issue to it. Right. Yeah. I don't think anybody would, it's not just that they would be, wouldn't be un, unhappy, but they would literally stop making the analogy. They wouldn't be saying, well, you know, more people have died of the flu. They'd be like, Oh, okay. Well, you're protecting me from this new thing. That's funny that you bring up that example. Um, and, and I don't want to, accidentally or subtly yeah. sort of corner you into this. Well, guess what, Steve, on this interview, you're an expert on coronavirus and I'm going to hold you to that because that's not yeah. what I intend to do. Right. And you I, know, I, and I, it's, I will dissuade myself of that. <laughs> yeah. It's and so the notion that I've got that expertise. Yeah, exactly. And so uh, as much as I want to unpack questions from, from a different intelligent viewpoint, yeah. which is what I see you as on this. Yeah. I have to be careful not to, you know, sort of like hold you up as the guy who's like got the, you know oh, what yeah, I mean? Yeah. No, yeah. I and mean, you benefit of the dad. I mean, you know, uh, playing devil's advocate or looking at it from different perspectives. Right. That's all cool with me. I'm fine with that. But it's interesting that you brought up the, the, the salary piece because I was talking to a friend of mine yeah. who, who leans more towards, let's just be safe, man. Let's just shelter in place. Yeah. You know, and and I lean more. Quite frankly, I lean more toward. I'm worried about the longer term economic ca catastrophic stuff and things like that. That's where I'm at with it. But it was so funny because he's making this unusually impassioned and 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 sort of thoughtful argument for staying at home. Mm -hmm. um, and I say unusually, only he will know that I'm referring to him. So I'm not. <laughs> you know, that passionate about things, that's really um, but usually he he doesn't go too deep into argumentation. He doesn't really like it. He's not. He's not. That's not his jam. Yeah. And so he's like giving me this really thoughtful argument, and I'm like, okay, I'm I'm, I'm hearing the things you're saying, right, right. and then he just looks at me straight faced, and he goes, "However, it's important to know that unemployment's paying me almost five thousand bucks a month to stay at home." <laughs> You know, <laughs> he yes. goes, I can't tell you what I'd think if I didn't have this, you know? Right, right. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't know how much further into using the coronavirus as a, as a touchstone we need to go. Um, the piece about mindset, I think is really, is really what's important for people to take away here. Yeah. Um, and I feel like mindset is sort of like sense of humor, right? Everybody thinks they have it. <laughs> 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 and yet, if you're at a party and you're trying to make people laugh and they're not laughing, chances are. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's the thing. 
<laughs> Tell me a little bit about your new book. Yeah. Um, okay. That's an interesting leap. Uh, well yeah, done. Man. That's how I do, by the way. And I yeah. dig it, man. I dig it. So the new book is called Bulletproof. Um, mm -hmm. What if everything that bugged you, blocked you, or brought you down didn't? So that kind of speaks to what we're talking about here. Yeah. And I want to point out the cover because it's, uh, you know, this professional, because the book is a, it's a business book. A lot of people in the business world have to face mm -hmm. the question of, you know, how do I, um, how do I function in a high pressure situation and still maintain my cool and be precise yeah. and be effective? So yeah. while we're being, you know, yelled at and while we've got all these various distractions, mm -hmm. uh, but the thing that I really love about this cover the most is that of all the distractions, the bullhorn and the, the, the you know, the phone and all that is the sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like, want something to eat? <laughs> and it, it, it's, it's funny. It's like sometimes the thing that you're <laughs> Is something so simple, right? I'm going to get this done. I'm going to make a big play. I'm going to start my new book. But you know, first I got to make is peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Right. Yeah. 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 So, uh, so anyway, so the book was really it wasn't inspired by the coronavirus because that this I wrote the book before that. Right. I actually wrote a book called Buddha and the Trenches, which was you know how to be calm and masterful in the battlefields of life, mm -hmm. and um, and I loved the title, but it it didn't get a lot of. Um, uh, it wasn't embraced because there were so many people who looked at it as like a Buddhist thing. They didn't want to, you know, as a yeah. book, right. So yeah. I basically re uh, I retitled it and made some changes in the book, but essentially it's the same book. Okay, cool. But, you know, bulletproof is, you know, this notion that, uh, that we're being, we're being shot at by a variety of things or being shot at by the virus, by yeah. the government, by the, yeah. uh, you know, by our peers, by, you yeah. know, by our own, by our own selves. Right. Mm -hmm. So what do we do to kind of shed that? How do we, you know, how do we maintain our, our most effective, happy, joyful selves mm -hmm. in the midst of mayhem when everything's yeah. going on around us? And it's remarkable, you know, cause I've had that experience and I'm sure you have too, where you look at some situation that maybe in the past would have just, you know, torn you apart. Mm -hmm. We're just sort of, floating through it you're still doing everything yeah. you need to do but you're just yeah. not being pulled down emotionally by it and that's right. what the book is about this conversation has been like that for me no just kidding <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah right yeah, yeah. tearing you apart wrecking your, exactly well that's what i try to do in all of my talks i try to make my book more relevant by like creating a lot of anxiety and stress yeah. <laughs> and then solve and it for saying, people i've got the solution right here yeah, that's right that's <laughs> right that's that's just that's just solid strategy um I gather that you draw a lot from uh, Buddhism. Yeah, from mindfulness practices in general. Mindfulness practices in general. Yeah. yeah. So we have agreed that mindset yes. is sort of the one of the foundational pieces. What is, in your opinion, the, the first foundational piece of deliberately moving toward a more beneficial mindset? What's the foundational piece of the foundational piece? Well, for the first foundational piece is choose happiness first. In other words, mm -hmm. decide that you're setting the intention that if you're if you're wandering around amidst the various things going on around you, mm -hmm. what's more important to you to be right or to be happy? Yeah, right. I ask that question a lot, actually. Yeah. Um, I, I usually put it like, would you prefer to be happy or would you prefer to be right or would you prefer to have good relationships? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Be because so, uh, in yeah, in many cases, people who really, really need to be right, uh, you it's not too hard to find, you know, the threads fraying on their relationships, right? <laughs> it's well, they're they're operating and most people who are really addicted to again, addicted to rightness, it's 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 a hypnotic process. That's why my first book is called Unhypnosis. Mm -hmm. They don't realize the degree to which our beliefs and our, you know, kind of our our kind of core structure of what we think is true is yeah. influencing how we see things and then how we react to them. Right? So the true happiness first is the thing that says, and it's not like, like the Pollyanna thing of choose happiness first, meaning I'm going to put a smile on my face and just be happy no matter what it's, it's that right. I'm, I'm creating a, um, a, a yardstick for whether mm -hmm. I'm effective in the world as to whether or not I am able to achieve or move toward, um, toward happiness, toward acceptance. Right. So that's the first foundational principle. It's not the only one, but it's one of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like the distinction between the Pollyanna thing and the uh, and the um, sort of autonomous, empowered, 
you know, eyes wide open kind of choice. Yeah, you know, it, in fact, that's exactly right. You can't do it through the uh, through uh, shielded eyes. It's got to be. I'm. I see what is. It's like they yeah. operate based on objective reality. Mm -hmm. so I see the objective reality. I see what's going on, yeah. and I'm choosing to be happy. Oftentimes, the pushback that I hear is expressed in terms of things like, but you don't know what I'm feeling. But you don't understand how this feels. How do you respond to, to what's at the heart of those kind of reactions to the conscious endeavor to choose happiness? Well, I would say that uh, there's a big misunderstanding, and I used to be up against that same one myself, which is um, choosing to be happy is not choosing to feel happy. It's Tell me more about that. Say more about that. In other words, you're not uh, right now. I'm depressed. I'm miserable. And somebody comes along and says, oh, just cheer up. I want to punch him in the freaking mouth. Right. Yeah. That's the thing that I'm not talking about. Okay. I'm not going to choose to be happy as in, come on, change the way you feel inside. Yeah. I'm saying that in this moment, I acknowledge and, re and, and, and recognize that I am feeling miserable. Mm -hmm. And my stance in life is to choose happiness as in. I'm not there now, and I'm not going to pretend I'm there now. But the fact that I am where I am tells me that I'm, you know, that that I've got some work to do. Now, okay. Okay. Now, what is that work? Okay. So it's not like yes, I do know how you feel. Yes, I do know. I've been there myself. I understand what it feels like to be depressed, to be anxious, to feel low self-esteem, to feel uh, hopeless. I mean, I know all those feelings. I don't know what you feel right now, but I know I've felt all those things myself. And that the answer isn't to say. Oh, just be happy. The answer is to right. say, okay, I'm not happy, and happiness is an ideal toward which I am aspiring. How do I get Therefore, there? Therefore, how do I get there? Yeah. Right. I think so that's that brings up the next four parts of the formula. Yeah. Yeah. So if we're talking about bulletproof, which is based on mindfulness principles, uh, and and really flat out, what did what did uh, you know, what did the spiritual masters teach us? What did the Jesus teach us? What did the Buddha teach us? What did, you know, uh, uh, and any of Krishna teach us? What, what are the, the lessons? And the first lesson is you set the intention. In other words, I'm, not, I'm never going to get to Detroit unless I decide I'm going to Detroit. Right. Right. But I'm not going to say I'm now in Detroit. Right. And nobody could say to me, oh, come on, just be in Detroit. <laughs> so, come on, just cheer up, be in Detroit. Just be in so Detroit. I say, okay, Detroit's where I'm trying to get to. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to evaluate um, the, the structure of my life, the structure of my life, meaning um, am I operating based on uh, foundational principles that tend to lead in the direction of a successful and happy life? And those principles generally have to do with um, having a moral underpinning, like being a good person, yeah. um, having some structure to your life. Yeah. Right? Having disciplines, yeah. being impeccable, like you know, responsibility, accountability, integrity, impeccability. Those are all the, that's kind of the foundation. What I might call that your code of conduct. Yeah. Because if you're trying to be happy and you're always miserable, you've got no code of conduct, you've got no structure. Then it, it's impossible because discipline is freedom. <laughs> the very act of beginning to create disciplines in your life begins to force you not to operate purely on the basis of your emotions, which might be draining, yeah. but it gives you some personal power. So that's the next step is to kind of create a foundation. That's why religion, see, this is where religion unfortunately stops, starts and stops for most people, which is thou shalt not kill. You know, you got your 10 commandments, yeah. Yeah. you know, you got your uh, four noble truths or whatever, but then, well, what about, what about walking the path, right? What right. about doing the work? So, it's not just about being a good person. It's not just about being moral. It's not just about, you know, uh, going to church every Sunday. That's, those are all lovely things you can do to, uh, to establish rituals. Mm -hmm. But then the next step is infinitely more important, and that's, that's the application of, of focus toward the, toward the end of being more present. So... Um, in order to choose happiness, and I think this is a really important distinction, <clears throat> we don't, that doesn't mean we have to be happy all the time. Right. No. And it definitely doesn't mean we just plaster on the Pollyanna smile. Right. It means that we have 
an understanding <clears throat> that happiness is what we have sort of autonomously and, and through self-empowerment chosen to move toward. Mm -hmm. And then what you're saying that from there is um, you need, I'm paraphrasing you here, obviously, but you need some sort of a, a like a moral North star. Mm -hmm. You need to set in place certain things that you, you agree with yourself that the pursuit of those things will create the byproduct of happiness. Yes, exactly. So that's really okay. well put. So that, you know, and it's not just morality that we're talking about. We're talking about, you know, making your bed in the morning or, you know, uh -huh. walking the dog every day. We're talking about creating a structure that, um, that allows you to count on yourself for more than just being the blob of, you know, a puddle of depression on the floor. So that's the second part, but because, because discipline, it creates the opportunity to take the next step. Mm -hmm. And the next step is, uh, is the application of focus. So this is where mindfulness practice comes in. Yeah. Right? This is where sitting and meditating or taking a walk and, and looking at nature and noticing when your mind is wandering and bringing it back again. It's, you know, again, had you not, you know, de develop some kind of code, some kind of structure to the way your mind works, then as soon as your mind wanders, you're just going to go off with it. Mm -hmm. But instead, I'm now beginning to cultivate the ability to be more present, be here now. Yeah. Teach people to like, you know, when you're washing the dishes, wash each dish as if it's your cherished child. Yeah. And then move on to the next dish. So you develop mm -hmm. a hyper focus on the present moment and it starts to create some kind of a, um, a distancing within you between the um, between the stuff going on and your thoughts and the essence of who you are you know you start to develop the oh, yeah. I am the I am the awareness of this moment and oh yeah. and there's that thought that I'm not good enough oh and there's that thought yeah. that the government's trying to take my freedom or whatever it is yeah. those are all just they aren't you right yeah. so the question is yeah I mean you can go down that road if you want but what an awesome opportunity what an awesome opportunity to notice these things and be able to notice them from the place of being backstage. Right. Not letting them win. Not letting them get the, the best of you. And so that process of separating yourself from your kind of monkey mind. Yeah. And from reactivity yeah. begins to it, it it drives a wedge in that where that is ultimately filled by wisdom. Mm. And then you start feeling differently and you don't know why. So that's why, you know, you might start a, a meditative practice or some other kind of a mindfulness practice. And then a week or two later, you notice that that really irritating, aggravating person that you see, you know, on, on the, on the uh, street is no longer aggravating or irritating to you. You just kind of have right. this kind of beneficent smile when you see them. You're like, yeah, OK, cool. <laughs> and that's I always tell people that one of the best reasons to learn to meditate is that you'll be able to survive family gatherings more effectively. <laughs> that that yeah. in and of itself should seal the deal for people. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that humor, that that patience, that that acceptance that naturally evolves, not from I've got to make myself feel that way, mm -hmm. but just because you're starting to apply the laws of focus. Right. Yeah. So in Buddhism, it's Shila, Samadhi, and Panya. So Shila is you develop like the structure of life. You know, it's, that's your moral compass. That's your Ten Commandments. Samadhi is focus. It's the constant application of let me keep bringing my mind back into the moment. And when it wanders, I bring it back and I bring it back and I bring it back until now what begins to arise is a new neurological phenomenon that shows up as wisdom. It shows up as, oh, this happened and I felt this way. And there's like a distance between between yeah. stimulus and response yeah. that didn't exist before. Which it's is, like the Matrix. Now I'm like the bullet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that um, when you start talking about the distance between stimulus and response, uh, you're really, really connecting with uh, a, a big aha moment in my life. I had heard it couched in mindfulness and and. Buddhist terms and, and, you know, Taoist terms. Mm -hmm. And, you know, those are, those are deliberately written to be sort of mystical and, and, and mm -hmm. open to interpretation. And then I came across Frankel and Stephen Covey and was like, oh, okay, well, yeah. Okay. Now, <laughs> of course. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's very helpful and, and, and uh, clarifying for me. 
Um, I am, we are at the hour and I want to be mindful of your time. So I want to give you a chance to tell everybody where to find you and yeah. your book. Sure. Uh, so Bulletproof is available on Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's also, if you're interested in getting a free uh, digital download of the first chapter, chapter and change, uh, go to bestofsteve.com. Best, bestofsteve.com. Best okay. And they'll, they'll give you an opportunity to join my mailing list. And I send out, you know, newsletters and, you mm -hmm. know, I don't want to call them newsletters. That sounds like there's news. I have no news. <laughs> <laughs> I just I just like to talk about the stuff we're talking about now. So I've usually got a story and something to, to offer. Um, but then you get the free digital download of the first chapter of the book. And then if you like what you read, um, then at the when you get to the end of it, it'll it'll send you off to Amazon to get it. Cool. So, yeah. Well, thanks so much for joining me and uh, and going where the conversation led us. I appreciate that. Yeah. I thought it was uh, I thought it was rich. And it was a rich emotional tapestry, man. <laughs> well, we, so, we can't do it any other way, man. That's yeah. <laughs> I just have to read this comment from Doug Crow. Two oh, of God. my favorite peeps, nitro meat glycerin. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's good, that. Doug. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Boom. Doug, Love it. Doug, I, I, I don't get to see enough of Doug, but whenever we connect, it's always awesome. He's a great guy. I feel the same way. And I feel the same way about you, man. Thank you. No so thanks so much for joining us today. I appreciate it. I hope that um, I'm looking at my phone here from time to time, and it looks like quite a few people were jumping on. So I've got this broadcast about four different places simultaneously. Okay. Yeah. One, one of them's a watch party, but I don't see the watch party feedback on the computer, which is where I'm seeing you. But it looks like it went pretty well. Oh, that's good. I'm mean, now. I just noticed. I realized there's like a live comment section. So Glow joined us, and Amanda joined us, and Doug. So I, you know, thanks you everybody for uh, for participating. And I wish that I were aware of that earlier. I would have like done a shout out sooner. But uh, yeah, thank you guys for your comments. It's awesome. Yeah, well, we appreciate that, and and we wouldn't have wanted to have risked uh, interrupting the flow. I thought it went pretty well, man. Yeah, I think so too. That was cool. Um, okay, brother. Absolutely. Absolutely, man. Thanks for being here. Later.